Good morning, everyone. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 14. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forget your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So good morning. Just have a little slurp. You wouldn't like me to lose my voice, would you? As always, it's a privilege to bring you the talk on a Sunday, and uh, I always like to begin to pray. So, Heavenly Father, just be with me this morning as I bring this message to these people today. And may these words be pleasing to you in every way. For we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So as Sarah's mentioned, we are continuing our series on front lines. How as Christians and the church, we are making a difference for God out in his world. There's no more successful church than one that is seeing people growing in fruitful relationship with Christ out in the places where they spend most of their time on their front lines with the people that they naturally connect to doing the things they do every day for him alive in Christ in all of life Monday to Saturday as well as Sunday we are the church in mission gathered and scattered and we make all the difference in the world the church is a body of people living in a rhythm of gathering and scattering, usually gathering on a Sunday and scattering the rest of the week. So despite being a minority, Christians make all the difference in the world for Christ, wherever they are, whatever they do, whoever they are, Monday through Saturday. And to grow as disciples for these front lines, we need one another. We need to be together as a worshipping community. So, so far in our series, we have looked at making a difference wherever we are and whatever we do. And today, we're looking at whoever we are. So I want to begin by asking you that question. Who are you? you and I'm going to challenge you so we know how we like to chat to each other so I'm going to ask you to chat to people around you now and ask that question I want you to ask the person next to you who are you and if you're online then please if there's somebody with you then ask them or just consider the answer to that question but I'm going to ban an answer You can't say your name. 
okay? So ask the person next to you now, who are you? I'm going to give you a minute or two. Who are you? But you can't answer with your name. Sorry, sorry to interfere. You seem to be having a good time there. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that it uh, provoked discussion amongst you. And uh, I wondered, I wonder, how did you answer each other? So we heard Neil talk before about his profession. Sometimes we use our profession as a way of answering. We can say, you know, I'm a nurse or I'm an engineer, the owner of a business. We often connect who we are with our jobs. Or if we're retired, maybe we answer by saying we're a mum or a dad or a grandparent. But how we respond to that question, who are you, is really important if we are to be effective for God in our front lines. Take a look at this list. Sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, first fruits of God's creation. I wonder, did any of you answer with any of those expressions? Most of us, if asked, who are you, would probably be unwilling to say, I'm a child of God, or a son or daughter of the King, or a temple of the Holy Spirit. We may rightly worry that it would be off-putting to non-Christians, I'm painting the picture that we are some sort of religious fanatic, maybe. And I would definitely have reservations in certain situations of not answering that way. And I do recommend to apply wisdom in all situations. But even if we don't say it, the very minimum we should do is think it. Whenever any sort of question asks of us, who are we? Our first thought must be that we are a child of God, a son or daughter of the King, someone who is of infinite worth and value to God, so much so that he sent his son to the cross for us, someone who has a promise of eternal life through faith in Jesus. Our significance and our lives on the front line flow only from this identity. If my first thought is that I am Jeff Fallows, business owner, husband to Helen, father of Ben, Josh and Emily, son of John and Kathy, brother to Barry and Leslie, chairman of trustees of Ormskirk Food Bank, member of Christ Church ministry team, or any of those labels, then I'm missing my true identity. I am, just as you are, a child of God first and foremost. And that is, and it is that identity which gives me the strength to handle life's challenges. Anything else will just exhaust me. Without that identity, the world and its confused value system will slowly eat away at me. 
Only when we truly recognize that we are a child of God, loved and valued by him, can we operate on our front lines effectively, strengthened and inspired by him. This week on Lectio 365, we heard the story of Henry Nguyen. Educated by Jesuit priests in the Netherlands, Henry was drawn to the importance of psychology despite the church's concerns that it undermined Christian faith. He graduated as a psychologist in 1963 and he moved to America to study further, developing his teaching and writing on pastoral theology. He went on to lecture at Notre Dame, Yale and Harvard, becoming known for his teaching on depression, intimacy and love. Henry focused his autobiographical writing, writing style on the theology of the heart, seeking a personal connection with Jesus that shaped everything else. He said in one of his later books, the knowledge of Jesus' heart is a knowledge of the heart. And when we live in the world with that knowledge, we cannot do other than bring healing, reconciliation, new life, and hope wherever we go. For Henry, learning about Jesus was more than just head knowledge. He was passionate about the way human hearts and bodies connect with Jesus in prayer, worship, and adoration. The intimacy of a personal relationship rather than just religious ritual or theological knowledge. Our love and devotion of Jesus begins with a posture of openness of both heart and body, allowing Jesus to love us so that we can love him in return and then reflect his love to others. As Henry Nguyen taught, that awareness and acceptance of the love of Jesus enables us to shape our identity in the right way. I have no doubt if Henry Nguyen was asked who he was, he would say that he was a son of the king because he firmly knew the love of Jesus in his heart and allowed that to shape who he was. Our Bible reading today from Matthew's Gospel is Jesus' teachings to his disciples on how to pray more famously known as the Lord's Prayer. It's what will give us the structure to help us build our identity in Christ. That's why Jesus gave this prayer to his followers. The disciple John was exiled to Patmos at the end of his life, where the visions in the Revelation were given him. And a later monk of Patmos no doubt recalling how John leaned across to Jesus at the Last Supper declared this. Those who lean on Jesus' breast hear the heartbeat of God. Those who lean on Jesus' breast hear the heartbeat of God. It starts with an assurance of our identity as children of God. The Lord's Prayer aligns us with his purposes in the world. It reaffirms an attitude of constant reliance on him for sustenance, forgiveness, power and protection. Serving God is not about trying harder, but about allowing God to work in and through our lives. To trust that God's will be done in any situation will be the best result and, and enable us to cope with change to ask today for God to provide for our daily needs, recognizing we have total reliance on him. And praying for tomorrow's walk and work to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus seems to think that we shouldn't be too confident about our, our own ability to keep going as disciples. There's an enemy who wants to seduce us away from the ways of the kingdom. And so times of testing will come. And here we are called to pray for protection and deliverance. We don't go on to our front lines alone, but the powerful 
protecting, life-giving presence of God is with us. Serving God on our front lines is not about trying harder. It's about learning to allow the resurrection power of God to work in and through our lives as we embrace the things that God has asked us to do. But it begins with a clear sense of our identity.